we're in Psalm 143. We're going to look at the Psalms 143, 144, and prayerfully we'll get to Psalm 145. So beginning here in Psalm 143 at verse 1, this is a psalm of David. And David the psalmist writes, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he, he has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land, Silah. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. This is a prayer of King David. Notice as we begin that he's crying out to the Lord for help once again. As we look at this particular psalm, there are certain words he uses as he makes his plea to the Lord. Let me point those words out to you. Notice how he says things like, hear my prayer, give ear to my supplications, Answer me, that word answer in, in Hebrew means respond or come to my relief. Answer me. He says to the Lord, do not hide, deliver me, teach me, lead me, revive me. And so this is a prayer of King David as he's crying out to the Lord and he needs the Lord's help at this time. And he's making it very clear even as he begins his prayer, and I want you to notice this, that he's dependent on God. And he's making it very obvious that unless God helps him, he's not going to make it. As he begins to pray, he's casting himself on the Lord's faithfulness and he's casting himself on the Lord's righteousness. Notice how he says in verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me and in your righteousness. See, David in the Old Testament is praying to the Lord basically on the same basis that we in the New Testament pray to the Lord. God has given to us opportunity to lift our requests to him. And when we do make our request known unto him, when we do bring our supplications to him, we do so on the basis of his faithfulness and on the basis of his righteousness. In First, uh, First John, in chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, that word just, righteous, faithful and righteous to uh, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when we come to the Lord in prayer, we actually in the New Testament are going on the same basis, if you will, as David did there in the Old Testament. He's approaching the Lord. He's saying, I need your help. I need you to deliver me. I need you to revive me. I need you to come quickly to help me. And I'm pleading with you on the basis of your, your goodness towards me, on your, on your faithfulness, as well as the fact that you are righteous. And that's how we pray. That's, that's how you and I, as we take our requests and make them known to the Lord, that's part of the basis that we approach him on, his faithfulness and his righteousness. He says in verse 2, uh, do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. So he's aware of his own unrighteousness. David is well aware of the fact that he is a sinner, that he has a sin nature. You see, God could very well say to him, why should I save you from your troubles, David? Why should I intervene on your behalf? What is it about you that should commend you to me? What is it that is about you that should, should make it necessary for me to even listen to you? You know, one of the things that David has that many people in, in the 21st century doesn't have is an awareness of how righteous God is and, and an awareness of how unrighteous he is. Today we have a lot of people who don't have a clue about how righteous God really is and, and have very little understanding of how bad man in general really is. You know, we're not as good as we think we are. A lot of people say, well, no, I'm a lot better than you are, Pastor. Well, that may be so, but you're not as good as Jesus Christ. 
And the standard that we use isn't, isn't some other individual, is it? It's, it's Jesus himself. And when we have a good and a healthy self-estimation, I really believe that's the, that's the doorway into humility. When you really recognize, when I really recognize that I don't have anything, I have nothing to commend me to God, then that really is a, a good place to be. In the book of Job, if you take notes, it's found in Job chapter 25. In Job chapter 25, verses 4 through 6, listen to this. It's very flattering. So flattering. How then can a man be righteous before God is the question. That's a great question that's been asked for ages. How can a man be made righteous before God is the question. Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who's a worm. Now, isn't that flattering? You know, some wife just hit her husband. I saw you. See, you're a maggot. I've been calling you maggot for the longest time, and you're a worm too. A maggot and a worm. How flattering for the writer to let us know what human nature really is. Maggots, well, maggots thrive on, on death, don't they? they? They thrive on decay. And that's basically what he's saying here. Our nature is... Is, a, is like that. The Bible in Psalm 130, verse 3 says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? You see, that's a quite obvious thing. If we begin to understand that in reality God is holy and we are not, uh, that we have no real basis to call upon Him when it comes down to our own righteousness or access based on how good we are, that's a real good place to be because it causes us to throw ourselves down at His feet and ask for his mercy. And that's basically what we see the psalmist doing here when he says that. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. In verse 3, for the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. So he has an enemy, and notice the enemy is unnamed, but this unnamed enemy has hunted him down and has crushed him. When he speaks about being crushed, it speaks of being broken into pieces. He feels like he's been robbed of his life, and he even feels like he's been abandoned. His spirit or his physical life is overwhelmed. When he speaks of that, it speaks of him being weak or faint. It reminds me of what we read in Jonah chapter 2, verse 7, when, when Jonah said, My soul fainted within me. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. My, my soul fainted within me. I am, I'm at this point in my life that I feel that all of my life is being pressed out of me. Slowly but surely, I'm being pressed and crushed. It reminds me also of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's going through that oil press experience and as he was calling out to the Lord on three occasions to his father, uh, a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more was being pressed out of him. And so David is speaking about that here, even as he says, this is what I feel like. I'm being pressed. My spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is distressed. Verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land, Selah. The word Selah means meditate or think about this. And so part of his, uh, if, if the remedy is to begin to remember how God has been faithful in the past. Even though right now I feel like I'm crushed, I'm overwhelmed, and I'm distressed, I'm remembering that, that you have been faithful to me. And remembering how God has been faithful to you in the past will strengthen and encourage you to continue trusting in the Lord. You know, as I was preparing this message and all, I began to think about that, and without going into a lot of illustrations or personal testimonies, I can say this. I do believe I understand to a degree what he's speaking about because there have been times in my life, and I believe that it's probably true with every believer in this room, when you've gotten pressed and you've gotten to the point where you're distressed and you begin to think, what am I going to do, Lord? You know, i got no solution for this problem. I don't know what to do. And one of the things that the Lord does is He begins to remind you of how good and how faithful He's been to you over your whole life. That's what He does to me. I actually begin to just muse or to think about what God has done over my lifetime, how good God has been to me 
from the day I got saved and even prior to getting saved, how merciful God has been to me. For so many times I could have died from one thing or another, an early death, and God was merciful to me. And then after getting saved, seeing the Lord moving in my life, providing in so many different ways, and so I too will look into the past. I too will remember the days of old and meditate on his works and, 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 and muse, he says, on the work of his hands. And then crying out to him, spreading your hands before him and saying, Lord, I am so thirsty for you. Now you can go into Israel and you can go into what is called wilderness. And the wilderness is dry. It's, it's, uh, it's just barren out there. And so when it rains, the rain hits that dry parched ground and it just soaks it up because it's in need of the moisture and that's the point that he's making my soul is parched it's dry and and when your water hits it i just soak it up i i need you and i need you to fill me and, I, and i'm asking you to do that and the psalmist in psalm 77 verse 11 said i will remember the works of the lord surely i will remember your wonders of old and I long for you, Lord, even as I think about that, and I desire you to minister to me. So he says in verse 7, Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Lord, I can't stand this anymore. I need you to speak. I've been praying to you. But like a watchman is hungering and desiring the dawn, even so, Lord, I hunger and desire for you to respond to me. And I'm asking you to do it quickly. I feel like I'm abandoned. I feel like I'm in a pit. And the only thing that's going to revive me is you. I'm awaiting for you, Lord, and I'm asking you to move on my behalf. Verse 9, deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God, your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. I'm overwhelmed, but I will steadfastly trust in you. I hide myself in you because I have a relationship with you. And so I'm asking you to deliver me. I'm asking you to rescue me. I'm asking you to teach me by your spirit. I'm asking you to lead me, and I'm asking you to bless me. And I'm crying out, asking you to do these things. Verse 10 is a powerful scripture when he simply says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Teach me to do your will. How do you do that? Through your word and through your spirit. And so, Lord, train me that I might serve you. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, Cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. In other words, preserve my life, and as you do so, deal with those who are my enemies, Lord. You see, I'm going through a hard time. I'm going through a time of despair, but in the midst of all of that, I still will cling to you. I still will trust in you. I've learned to do that because I've learned to think of what you've done for me in the past. I believe... By way of application and conclusion of this one particular psalm, I believe that what David is saying here is, is typical of what people who serve the Lord may cry out also. It's not, it's not a unique to him. Um, every person who wants to serve the Lord has those dry times. Every, every person who wants to serve the Lord has those times when people may be opposing and oppressing. Every person who wants to serve the Lord should cry out and say, God, I, I want you to lead me in the way that I should walk. God, I want you to teach me your will. God, I want your spirit to lead me. That's just the way it is in Christianity. You know, once again, I really do believe that as we read through the Psalms, we see an open-hearted book. We see, we see psalms of joy and rejoicing and how God is moving, and we also see uh, humanity where it's in, in a desperate need. And that's one of the reasons why, as I've gone through the, psalms, through the psalms myself, the Lord has been tremendously ministering to me. It's been a real blessing because I, too, in verse 11, have cried out, revive me for your name's sake. I need life. I was alive once, Lord, but wake me up again. Revive me. Give me life once again. Now, Psalm 144. Another psalm of David, beginning at verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower 
and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks vain words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings I will sing praises to you. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks vain words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculptured in a palace style, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And so David here in Psalm 144 actually is penning what we would call a combat psalm. David is praising the Lord for protecting and for supporting him. And notice how he says it in verses 1 and 2. He said, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, my loving kindness, fortress, high tower, deliverer, shield, uh, the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. David is a warrior king who serves a warrior king, if you will, God being his warrior king. And so he trusts in the divine warrior. God is a rock to him. God is a fortress to him, a tower. He is the one who delivers. He is his shield. And so as he's speaking to him, he blesses the Lord for training his hands for war. David was a military man. David, from the time he was a youth, was a very courageous individual. I mean, you read through your Bible and you read concerning King David, and, and indeed this is a young man who from, from being a youth was a very powerfully courageous individual. We all know the stories that relate to King David, especially the story of, of Goliath and, and, and his battle against this incredibly tall man, the, the giant Goliath who is, according to Scripture, nine feet nine inches tall, a man who had a, a spear that was like a weaver's beam where the, uh, the, uh, the spearhead weighed 15 pounds. Uh, Goliath was an individual who wore bronze armor and his top portion of it weighed 125 pounds. He was an enormous, enormously powerful man. We all know the story of King David, how that before he was called King David, he was just a shepherd boy, and that he went out there into the battle to find, uh, actually to check the condition of his brothers who were there in Saul's army, and how that when he approached and heard this giant taunting the armies of Israel, and in doing so blaspheming the name of God, we all know the story of how he spoke to Saul and said, give me an opportunity and I'll take this guy down. And Saul was head and shoulders above everybody in Israel, so he was the tallest man in the nation, and he was afraid of this nine-foot, nine-inch warrior. And he begins to speak to David, and he says to him, you are but a youth, and, and, and this soldier out there has been a, a combat veteran from his youth. He's been a warrior from his youth. You haven't got a chance against him. And, and David says, well, let me tell you something. You know, I keep my father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear comes and, and uh, threatens the sheep, he says, I, I take it by the beard and I, and, I, and I kill it. If I can kill a bear and if I can kill a lion, then what's this guy going to be? He's nothing. And, and Saul says, well, well, cool, go get him. You know, and he gives him his, his armor. And you have to picture David is probably in his, you know, five feet two or five feet four or whatever the common height of a, a Jewish man of his day was. He wasn't a very tall man. And, and Saul was, you know, in his six feet, somewhere in the six feet range. And all the tallest man in Israel only came up to his shoulder. And so he's got David's, uh, David putting on his armor. And you can picture that for just a moment as, as David puts on this massive armor that doesn't fit him. He'd never tried it. It isn't going to work. 
And so he says, you know what, I'd rather go out with what I know. And he goes out with his sling. He picks up five smooth stones. And we know the story, how he sinks the stone in the middle of the giant's forehead. That giant came walking out and looks at him and taunts him by his gods and, and says, you know, what is this, a dog? What are you doing coming out bothering me? Come over here and I'll, I'll feed your flesh to the vultures. You know, let's take care of this quickly. And the Bible says that David just runs out to meet him. And as David is running towards him, he's taken one of those stones, he's putting it in his sling, and he's beginning to move that sling. And he gets close enough to him and he lets it go and it sinks in the middle of this giant's forehead. And the guy just, man, yeah, didn't know what's happening. And he falls down and David goes and picks up his sword and chops off his head lifts up this giant head and shows it to all the Philistines. The Philistines see this little guy there with a sling and a giant head that's half the size of his body. <laughs> and he's saying, next. And when he does that, they just take off running. And then suddenly, the army of Israel becomes courageous. And off they go, and the battle is won. David was a warrior king. He had no fear. He had no fear of man. I mean, let's face it, fellas, you know, I talk as a man to man. If a nine-foot, nine-inch guy walked in here right now and said, I want to sit where you are, what would you do? Sure. You dust the seat off, you know, <laughs> sit him down. Can I get you something to drink? I mean, come on, man. And nine feet nine is so enormous that we can't even comprehend that. It's just picture him standing underneath a basket, and his head is almost touching the rim. That, you know, dunking for him is just doing this, just dropping the ball. I mean, this guy's enormous. And David was probably, you know, four feet smaller than him. No fear. No fear. Because he said, you come to me in the name of your gods, but I come to you in the name of mine. And, and I want you to know something. I'm going to take your head off today, and I'm going to feed your flesh to the vultures. Everybody will know that there is a God in Israel. David says... Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. The Lord has given me skill in the martial arts. And God is my rock. A rock is your refuge. You know, um, when you're in, uh, in Israel, we go into a place called En Gedi. And I've mentioned this to you recently. In En Gedi, they have the rock badgers. Little, little uh, animals that uh, are very small and, and have no natural protection. They can be eaten by their enemies very easily, but they climb into the rocks. And when they climb into the rocks, no matter how powerful that little that wolf is or that lion may be, he can't get to them because the rock provides his security and his protection. God is my rock. You know, I need him, in other words. Not only that, but he's my loving kindness, fortress, high tower, deliverer, shield and I take refuge in him. And as a result, he subdues my people under me. So he goes into verse 3, Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him? Or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. In comparison to the great and awesome God, man is insignificant. The point he's making is very simple. Man's life is brief and man's life simply passes away. Psalm 90, verses 9 and 10 says, All our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our, our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So in comparison to the eternal God, what is man? Well, man is nothing but a breath just that comes and passes. It's a shadow that passes by. His days are, are few. So he says, bow down your heavens, O Lord. Come down. Touch the mountains. They shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks in vain words, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. So he's asking the Lord simply, come down. He's remembering how the Lord came down in Sinai 
And he's basically saying, Lord, even as you came in such a wonderful display of power, I'm asking you to come and scatter your enemies. These enemies are idolaters. They're foreigners. They're, they're using lying intimidation, and I'm asking you to deal with them. Verse 9, I will sing a new song to you, O God, on a harp of ten strings. I will sing praises to you. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. When he says, I'll sing a new song to you, Lord, you have given to me songs in the past that I have sung concerning how you have given me victories over my enemies and all. I'm asking for a new victory so I can give to you praise in a new way. A new song for a new victory is what I'm asking for. And so, Lord, give to me a new victory so that I might continue to sing praises to you. In verse 11, rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks vain words, whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in, in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculptured in Palestine, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep uh, may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Rescue me is what he's saying. Rescue me, deliver me, and if you do so, this will be a blessing. It'll be a blessing to your people. And what I'm asking you to do is, is bless my sons, that they may live productive lives. I'm asking you to, uh, you to bless our daughters, that they may be beautiful. I'm asking you that you would take care of us and prosper them with, with lavish produce and livestock, and, and that they may live a life that is free of fear of foreign invasion and that they might live in peace all the days of their lives. By the way, this particular psalm that he is saying here, especially verses through 11 through 15, are, are verses that every parent in this room could echo. Lord, take care of my boys so that they can grow up and be strong and productive. Lord, take care of my little girls, that they may be beautiful ladies as they grow up. Lord, I just ask that you'd give to us beautiful peace in our cities so that we can go in and we can go out without fear. This is a wonderful prayer. And it's a prayer that he's asking the Lord to answer. And by the way, it's a prayer that I would pray along with him. Now, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. I'll pick up at uh, verse 1, and I'll take it to verse 7, then we'll move on. He begins here in verses 1 through 3 by simply saying, I'm going to be blessing you because every day you have been faithful to me. This, once again, is a, uh, a psalm of King David, and he's just blessing the Lord for how good God has been. Notice in verse 2, I, every day he says, I'll bless you. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. We worship the Lord, guys, as believers. Not weekly. You know, some people have a, a religious regimen, if you will. They go to church on a weekly basis. And perhaps when they go to church or, or whatever, when they're there, that's their time of worship. Well, you know, I've discovered something. Yeah, that's great. We worship together on Wednesday night, and we worship together on, on Sunday morning, and, and we worship together as a community on Sunday night, and we can worship together on a Monday when you have, a, you know, a cooking class or a, or a surrendered Bible study. You can, you can worship on a Tuesday when you have a, a discipleship program. You can do so on a Thursday when you have the, another discipleship program. You can worship the Lord in a variety of ways, but some people will worship the Lord once a week. We've been called to worship the Lord every day, every day. Every day, you wake up in the morning, I hope you do this, every day you wake up in the morning, and, and once you're aware of the fact that you are awake, once you're aware of the fact that you're still alive, once you're aware of the fact of where you are, uh, and you begin to look around the room and everything, and you say, wow, I, I made it through another night, then you say to the Lord, God, thank you. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I'll be glad in it. Lord, I thank you for giving to me another day. 
I can serve you in. I thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you've brought into my life. I've shared this with you. It's true. I wake up every morning, and I don't know if anybody else does this. I think probably many people do. But I always have a song. It's like my mind is a recorder, and I've got a song going every morning when I wake up. It'll be a, there'll be a song. And I bless the Lord. There'll be, there'll be times I, I wake up thinking of a song that I was listening to just the night before, the day before, a worship and praise song, and that's how I wake up in the morning. And I thank God for that. You see, I used to wake up with a world song in my heart. Now I wake up with the song of the Lord in my heart, and I bless God for that because that sets the tone for the rest of the day for me. It sets the tone. When I come to work and I turn on my, 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 my radio and I listen to Christian music, you know, on the way up, when I go home tonight, I'll turn on Christian music. I just love to hear the songs of the Lord, and it's, it's changing my life, just learning to worship the Lord in that way. And so it's not a, a, a only a Wednesday. Oh, it's Wednesday. I better worship God in the morning because tonight I got to teach the people. Oh, no, it's Saturday night. I better, I better start praying because tomorrow I've got to teach and better make sure that Sunday afternoon that I stay right with God. It's not that way at all, is it? It's every day. It's every morning when you wake up. It's realizing how great God is, how good He's been, and what a joy it is to serve Him. What a transformation He has brought into our lives. What a good thing it is that God saved us. And so naturally, I rejoice in him. Every day, he says in verse 2, every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. And he goes on to praise the Lord. He praises the Lord. Great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. We praise God because he deserves our praise. He's our king. Now, in verse 4, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I have... Uh, some friends of mine that I, that I would probably refer to them in this way. I would refer to them as my closest friends, pastors. You know, and very often we have gathered together. We have taken ministry trips together. I've traveled in the various countries with these, these fellas and all, and especially have traveled to South America with them. And, you know, there are a number of guys, Bob Grenier, who happens to be one of my very dearest friends, and and Randy Walls, a pastor of Calvary Chapel of Upland, and Jim Arate, who's a pastor of Cucamonga, and, uh, and uh, Raul Reese, and Pancho, and we're, we're, we're all very tight. We're all very good friends and all, and, and we have gone on trips for many years together, and, and it's not a, a vacation in any way. It's ministry. We minister together. We go to El Salvador, or we'll go to Chile, or we go to Colombia, or we, we travel together in South America, and as we do so, we, we, we spend an awful lot of time with one another because it takes hours and hours just to get to the location. And then we room together, and then we take time out, you know, to pray and have devotions and just open our hearts. And I can tell you that many times that we have gathered together, we have wept with one another as we've prayed for our families, as we have prayed for our churches, as we prayed for one another. And, and the Lord has, has blessed our fellowship tremendously in that, and I thank God for that because these men have been very rich in my life, and it's been so important. And it's helped me to, to really to be a stronger believer, to have strong believers near me and, 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 and being my friends and all of that. And as we've gathered together, one of the things that every one of us have shared amongst ourselves on more than one occasion is our great concern with the condition of the church in the 21st century. And I'm not going to go into a long diatribe or teaching about that, but I will say a few things. When he says, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts, the great concern that I have is to notice that that, that isn't necessarily true in every believer's life. Um, Raul and, and Bob, Grenier, and I... Um, come from a, a period that was referred to as, as the Jesus Movement. Now, we believe the Jesus Movement continues to move to this day, quite obviously. He hasn't stopped moving. But there was a big movement in the late 60s, early 70s that some of you are well aware of, and perhaps I have some veterans in here who were part of that, the Jesus Movement, where the Lord began to break down walls, denominational barriers, the Holy Spirit began to flood in the youth and guys like, like Bob, who at one time was a drug runner, who had his pilot's license, used to carry a 45. He was a pretty dangerous individual. You wouldn't know that, but he was. And guys like, like Steve Mace and guys like Rawl and Mike McIntosh and, and little hippie freaks like me, 
you know, our, you know, drugs and dope and, you know, the, 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 the uh, alcohol and all of those things that went along with it. Those things were my life. Rawls was violence. You know, and then God grabs a hold of you and radically transforms you, radically transforms you, makes you unrecognizable to those who know you best. Quite seriously. The radical transformation that God brought into my life was an absolutely freaky thing to my parents. They, the transformation was so incredible from a heartless, self-centered, alcoholic, druggie who used everybody for my own to suddenly care about people, pray for people, to hug my father and say, Daddy, I love you, to pray for my mom and share the gospel with her. You can't imagine, you can't imagine how it freaked them out. You can't imagine. But you see what happened when I got saved is I, I got saved at the Hollywood Palladium. The, the fellow who was the evangelist is a guy named Arthur Blessed, who's well known for carrying a cross around the world. He was the evangelist. He used to hang himself on a, a cross on Hollywood Boulevard. And people, the freaks, you know, Jesus, not, freak, not Jesus freaks, just the freaks, we were called freaks then, would just walk by, and he'd look down at them, and he'd say, are you guys ready for God? And he'd, he'd just, they'd go, whoa, you know, because this guy's on a cross. You know, what are you talking about? I'm not even ready for you, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, you got to be ready for God. And, and, and it was, those, were, those were incredible times. Some of you who may be old enough to remember them, those were incredible times, how the Lord was moving in fabulous ways. And, and so I got saved, and, and when I got saved, uh, they said, you know, these are the things you need to do. You need to read the Bible. You need to pray. You need to have fellowship. I didn't know what the word fellowship meant, but they, did, they said what you need to do is you need to have Christian friends who can encourage you, and you need to tell somebody about what God has done in your life. Don't, don't hide what God is doing. You know, let people know. So listen carefully because it's very important. The Jesus movement was evangelistic. Pastor Chuck Smith is known as a Bible teacher, but Pastor Chuck imparted to us the, the hunger and desire to reach out to the world to tell them about Jesus Christ. I mean, I've got people, you know, in my church. I have people that I, that I encounter who are Christians who find it easier to talk about their sound system, easier to talk about their wheels, easier to talk about the engine they just put into their car, easier to talk about their girlfriend or the clothes or whatever. It's so much easier and more natural to talk about that. But if they, if they were given the opportunity to talk about what God is doing in their life, they have nothing to say. They won't say anything because they're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and that I have seen to be true. Sometimes we get that from the generation going before us. I don't want that to be true of this fellowship. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of it. I was talking to, to Mike just a couple days ago. I said, you know, Mike, I would go to college classes. I said, you got to take this into consideration, man. I'm, I'm, I'm 24 years old. The only book I ever read was, was comic books for years. You know, I didn't have a vocabulary because I was into drugs and alcohol for so long. And, and hippies, I mean, if any of you remember hippies, our, our vocabulary was not very large. Well, that's heavy, man. Yeah. <laughs> Far out. That's cool. I mean, that was pretty much it. And, and, or we just made grunting sounds. <laughs> How you doing, man? <laughs> that's, anybody know what I mean? That's the truth. That's the truth. How you doing, man? Oh, you know, we, I mean, how brilliant is that? I mean, we didn't have a very broad vocabulary. When I got saved, I began to say, you know what? I've been wasting my life. I've been wasting my time, and I've wasted my mind. And so I started to read the Bible, and I, I got a King James Bible, and I would read King James, and the these and the thous and, and the archaic language just lost me. So I had to pick up something called the uh, uh, Living Translation or something like that. I forget what it was called. Good news for modern man. 
and I would read this paraphrase, and I'd read the King James, and then I got what is called the Layman's Parallel Bible, which had the King James and three other translations, and I learned what the King James meant by just comparing it with the other, other ones, and that's what I did. I was 20 years old, and I began to read the Bible, and I began to read these others, other translations so I could figure out what King James meant and all of that, and, and, and now I'm in the military, and, and I've got plenty of time on my hands because I drive a truck, so I start reading, and I'm reading C.S. Lewis, and I'm reading uh, uh, Tolkien, and I, and I pick up a guy named Hermann Hesse, who's a, a German existentialist, and I've got no clue what he's writing about because it's so beyond me. So I get a Webster's Dictionary, and I sit there in my, in my truck, and I read Hermann Hesse to try and figure out what's wrong with this guy, and as I'm doing that, he's using big words, and I'm opening up my dictionary, broadening my vocabulary. That's how it worked. That's how it worked for me. I made a decision to, to, to take what God was given to me. He gave me a mind. I want to sharpen it. I want to use it. It was dulled by drugs for so long that I want to use it for His glory. And that's what took place in my life. And I, I was handed a baton of faith. I was handed a baton by Pastor Chuck Smith, those who were over me and the others at, my, at Biola when I went to Bible college. They handed me a baton of faith, a baton that they had received from their mentors who received it from their mentors all the way back to Jesus handing it to His disciples. And I made a decision, and I, I'm going to be open about my faith. And I'm 25 years old, and I graduated from high school with a D minus average. I have no study habits. I don't know how to study and how to write. I don't know how to do that. But I have a passion in my heart, a passion in my heart to tell people about Jesus Christ. That's all I had. I'm telling you, that's all I had. I've got to take what he's given to me and give it to another generation. I have to do that. I have to do that. And so I've done it. So I've been doing it. And I invite you to do the same. Because if you don't have a passion for the Lord, your children are doomed. Your neighborhood's doomed. Your friends are doomed. Your mom and your dad are doomed. You see, I was one of these hippie kids. My dad and mom were already ashamed of what I was doing. Now that I'm a Jesus freak, here's something else to be ashamed of. I don't care. If you don't like me, mom, I don't care. Dad, if you don't like me, this is the truth. This is the truth. I don't care. doesn't matter to me whether you like me or not, frankly. I love you, and I want you to go to heaven. That was the heart when I talked to my dad. My dad's sitting there in the kitchen, and I walk in with, with my Bible open, and, and I'm three weeks old in the Lord, and I was taught, read the Bible. So I'd been reading Matthew all the way to Revelation. Now I'm at Revelation. So however long it took me to get to Revelation chapter 9, that's how long it was until I talked to my dad. And I walked in, and you know the story, and that's when I walked into the kitchen, and I'd read Revelation 9, and I walked into the kitchen, and I said, Mom and Dad, this is the Word of God. And I read Revelation 9, and as I read this particular chapter of women's hair and iron teeth and scorpion stings and wanting to die but unable to do so, and I'm reading this, and I said, uh, uh, I read it to my dad and Mom, and I said, I don't know what this means. But I do know this, it's not speaking to me. It's not addressing me, it's speaking to you. And I looked at my dad, and I said, that's when I said to my dad, Dad, you're a good man. You're the best man that I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. And I said, Daddy, I love you. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head and pray. You're going to receive Christ right now. That's when I led my dad to Christ because there was a passion that's still here. There was a passion in my heart to see people saved, to see their lives changed. It was a baton that was handed to me that I wanted to hand on to other people. You hear what I'm saying? And a lot of people don't have that, even in this church, don't have that. They are so busy thinking about other things, but they're not thinking of the right thing loving God with all of your heart, and everything else flows behind that. You're pushing a string. You can't do that. You have to pull it. In order to pull it and straighten it out, you need to have something that draws. For me, it's the Lord. He draws me, and He straightened out my life. And I wasn't straightened out because I had a great gal. My, my girlfriend, who became my wife, Marie, wouldn't even have dated me 
without the Lord. She didn't need another, you know, jerk in her life. She needed somebody that, that could, could treat her the way she should be treated. And God makes the difference. God changes everything. You see that? And the Bible makes it very clear, very clear that the generations are to hand the faith of God to others. Psalm 71, 18 says, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7, He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed an, a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, and that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. You know, it's a joy as a grandfather now to pray with my grandson Josiah before he eats, because even yesterday he was over and Grandma was feeding him, and, and I had sat down before he came and sat down with, with Marie. And uh, Marie sat him in his high chair, and I'd already prayed, and I was eating. And he's 21 months old, and I was eating, and all of a sudden I heard Josiah say, Grandpa, actually Papa, and I looked at him, and he's giving me this look, and Marie says, we have to pray. He hasn't prayed yet. And so he's looking at me with this, like, come on, man, we're going to pray. What's with you? And, and that was what he was doing. So she says, we have to pray. And she holds his hand, and she says, you know, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Amen. And while she's praying, he's staring at me. And then after she says amen, he starts to clap. Hey, hey, like that. We have taught him to do that. We have taught our grandson to do that, to rejoice when you pray. And to watch him do that touches my heart, to take God's Word and to put it into another generation, and now watching another generation that we're trying to pour his life into. Is there anything greater than that, guys? I don't think so. Listen, my son Dave or Joseph or Corinne, my daughter or Anna could come in and say, Dad, I just won the lottery, and I've got millions of dollars. You want some? And the answer, you, you, you might not believe this, is no, not really. No, not really. Why not? Well, because the Word of God says that I'm to lay up for my children, not the children, for the Father. You have it, and may God bless you with it. I don't really care because I don't need your money. You see, I've got something greater than the money. I've got greater things. I've got to walk with God that I really treasure. I've got a great wife that I can't, that I love more every day. I've got a great fellowship. I've got great friends. What else do I need? What else do I need? I've got more than one pair of shoes. And I've got several pairs of pants. I've got all that I need. I am so blessed by God. So what I really want is my kids to serve the Lord. And what I really want is my grandchild and children to serve the Lord. That's what matters. Not the things that they can afford to buy me. Not the things that they wear or drive. But what's in their heart. He says in verse 5, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. And so bottom line, he's just saying, I, I just believe the Lord is great, and he is so great that I just want to meditate on the things of the Lord and share these things with other people. I want to declare his greatness. In verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Indeed, the Lord is gracious. He is compassionate. Thank God that he is slow to anger, and thank God for his mercy. And yes, he is. He is good to all. We praise the Lord because He is compassionate, He's patient, and He is merciful. I thank the Lord that He has had tremendous mercy on me and patience with me. I thank the Lord that He waited those 20 years until I was willing to respond. Some in this room, He's waited a lot longer than that. He says in verse 10, All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. In other words, God, you are worthy of all praise. 
You don't have a limited shelf life. You are eternal, and therefore we will worship and praise you for all eternity. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. God, you are compassionate, and you are especially caring and loving to those who fall. That word fall there in verse 14, when it says he upholds all who fall, the word fall also speaks of failing. Every person in this room has an intent to follow the Lord, I would hope. Every believer in this room has an intention, a desire to follow God and not to fall. But guess what? We do, don't we? Don't we? We can fail, and we do. You wake up in the morning, you're not necessarily saying, mm, today I'm going to do this, 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 and that, and these are all bad things. You don't necessarily do that. But before you know it, you find yourself in line there at the gas station, and somebody's rude to you, and you start thinking something. Or you're on the freeway, and somebody cuts you off, or somebody's acting like an idiot. Or you're driving down the street, and somebody stops and looks around to see where they're supposed to be going, and you almost plow into the back, and before you know it, you're saying things like idiot. Or if you're not saying them, you're thinking them. I can remember I used to say idiot to drivers all the time, and I wasn't even thinking it. My son Joseph was about four years old, and we were driving one day, and some guy stopped, and I swerved around him, and, and Joseph yells out, idiot! <laughs> and, and, and he says, he's an idiot, isn't he, Dad? And I go, well, <laughs> what have I, been, have I been teaching my kid here, man? I mean, he picked it up. And I said, yes, he is. <laughs> but we probably shouldn't call him that, you know. You don't wake up in the morning intending to blow it. We fall. You know, it reminds me of when the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to his beloved apostle, Peter. And Peter is there on that night saying to the Lord that he'd never fail him. And the Lord says, oh, yes, you will. Yes, you will. He said, listen, Satan has desired to obtain you that he may sift you even as wheat is sifted. He said to Peter, you know what? He has asked for you, and he has obtained you. God has given him permission. My father has given Satan permission to sift you, even as he so long ago did to Job. He's going to sift you tonight. He's going to sift you like wheat is sifted. You're going to be going through the churn. You're going to be just tore up tonight, Peter. He said, but, he said, I have prayed for you. And after you have been converted, strengthen your brethren. You know, the Apostle Peter, this upcoming Sunday, will be looking at his denying of the Lord. We'll be looking at that in detail as we continue our study in Mark. And he did certain things that led towards his denial. And ultimately, the Scripture tells us that after he denied the Lord and the Lord looks at him and their eyes lock. Now, remember, Peter had said, I'll never deny you, even though Jesus said, yes, you will. And their eyes lock. The Bible simply says, and we'll be concluding our study on Sunday morning with this phrase, he went out and he wept. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. The Lord knew that he would fail. Peter didn't, but he did fail. And yet God says to us that when we fail, he lifts us up. And that's exactly what Jesus does because he restored his beloved apostle, and he will restore you too. And verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. He hears the cry of those who love him, but he destroys those who reject him. Those who not, do not turn to him are ultimately judged. Those who call upon him are encouraged. You know, throughout the Scripture, you see opportunities given to us to make decisions as to where we stand with the Lord. God calls, we respond. God calls, we reject. But God always calls. It's up to us. It's up to us, ultimately, will I respond to the call or not? If I do... The Lord's hand is upon me. He forgives me of my sin, cleanses me from all unrighteousness, and I have a new life in Him. If I don't, I stand before Him as my judge. Those are choices I have to make. Those are choices every human being will make. 